On today's episode, we are getting into all of the latest space race news, including the current state of space junk in low Earth orbit, the failed second stage of an Angara rocket making an uncontrolled plummet back to Earth, a brand new reusable space plane designed from Sierra, rocket startup Firefly run into trouble with the US government, Astra Space gets sued, and we have an update on what is going on with the SpaceX Starship. So let's get going. This is the Space Race. Industry experts have been coming out in recent days to warn the United States government that they need to start taking space junk seriously right now. Darren McKnight, senior technical fellow at LEO Labs and member of the International Academy of Astronautics Space Debris Committee said, Initiatives by the U.S. Space Force to fund debris cleanup technologies are good, but not nearly enough to address what is becoming a serious threat to the space business. Leo Labs is a private company based in California that uses ground-based radars to monitor debris in low Earth orbit. The remarks come on a January 6th webcast hosted by the University of Washington Space Policy and Research Center. McKnight says that unlike other countries, the United States is tackling the debris issue as a long-term problem that is decades away, but in reality, the risk of satellites colliding with debris objects is increasing rapidly and could soon begin to impact our ability to operate satellites reliably. McKnight told the audience, quote, I love the fact that the Space Force said, yes, we're concerned about picking up debris but I will tell you the US is woefully behind the rest of the world in this area. It's embarrassing to me hearing people talk about the need for active debris removal and the need for debris mediation as if it's something that's going to be decades out. Luckily for us, at least the European Space Agency and the Japan Aerospace Exploration Agency are moving to tackle this threat in a much more timely manner. Both are funding missions to remove debris objects within the next three years. And we are not talking about little shards and broken up bits here. We have really large dead payloads and rocket bodies floating around that pose a very major risk of smashing into each other and creating debris clouds. At worst, imagine something the size of a yellow school bus flying totally out of control at supersonic speeds. We've got a bunch of them up there and no one really knows what to do about it. McKnight says there isn't a single company right now that is planning to bring down a 9,000 kilogram object. Some of the scariest altitudes in low Earth orbit are from 750 to 850 kilometers, where there are numerous Russian, Chinese, and US dead satellites that have been abandoned over several decades. McKnight said commercial mega constellations like SpaceX's Starlink are often criticized for increasing the congestion in LEO, but from his point of view, these companies should be seen as victims that are increasingly at risk, saying, quote, old abandoned massive objects pose greater risk than smaller, more agile constellations. He added that many of these satellite operators are working with mitigation guidelines and operational procedures that are much more stringent than any government guidelines. They're actually being safer than what the government's asking them to do, but they are still going to likely have some difficult times in the near future because of debris objects. For a sense of scale, the US Space Command currently tracks about 35,000 debris objects and 70% of them are in low Earth orbit. Leo Labs tracks any softball size and larger objects. McKnight says that there are anywhere from 500,000 to 900,000 smaller items that are currently not tracked at all and that we just cross our fingers and hope won't hit anything. Speaking of how huge chunks of debris end up in space, the upper stage of a failed Angara rocket launch has re-entered the atmosphere. Luckily, not causing any harm by burning up over an empty section of the Pacific Ocean. In this case, the second stage of the Russian heavy lift rocket malfunctioned on its way to geostationary orbit and became dead in the water, so to speak. The test launch on December 27th was only carrying a dummy payload and was planned to complete a series of engine burns post-separation to reach a high altitude orbit, but malfunctioned during the second burn. That stranded the stage in a low transfer orbit that decayed over the next nine days. 
So it's like a good news, bad news deal. On the good side, the rocket didn't end up as one more giant floating debris in space, but on the downside, it came plummeting back to Earth totally out of control. Fortunately, the re-entry happened over the South Pacific Ocean, and it looks like none of the debris actually made it all of the way down to the surface. The whole rocket and payload just burned up in the atmosphere. But this is obviously not the kind of thing that we want to see happening often. Even a few shards coming down over a densely populated area could really hurt somebody. This is only the third test flight for the Angara rocket since its first launch back in 2014. The Russian space agency has intended this new vehicle to be a replacement for their aging workhorse rocket, the Proton. But Angara has been plagued by delays ever since it began development back in the 1990s. We've got a new release from the Consumer Electronics Show in Las Vegas, and this is definitely not something you will be using in your home, but still really cool. Sierra Space is at CES 2022, showing off the company's Dream Chaser space plane and Life Habitat, which will both be vital to supporting the company's proposed Orbital Reef space station. This new aerospace company, which is an offshoot of the Sierra Nevada Corporation, has been developing the Dream Chaser for quite some time now, and this is our first look at one of the designs. Dream Chaser is currently planned to take three forms, including a DC-100 cargo version, DC-200 crew version, and DC-300 cargo version capable of reaching geostationary orbit. You'll probably notice this is a very similar design to the old space shuttle, and the Dreamcatcher functions in a very similar way. As a cargo ship, Dreamcatcher can deliver at least 6 tons of payload to low Earth orbit, as a crewed vehicle it can support 6 astronauts, and its high altitude cargo variant can deliver 3.3 tons of mass to geostationary transfer orbit, which is very high up, around 37 thousand kilometers. The Dream Chaser has been in development since at least 2014, and so far the best look we've had at its performance was a 2017 glide test where they lifted the plane up with a helicopter and then dropped it. The Dreamcatcher managed to come in for a perfect landing and it was pretty impressive. Now, according to Sierra's updated timeline at CES, the company plans to have the DC-100 cargo variant in action this year, then follow that up with a crewed DC-200 in 2026, and launch cargo to geostationary orbit in the same year on the DC-300. We should point out that the launch vehicle for the Dreamcatcher is slated to be a United Launch Alliance Vulcan rocket, which has yet to actually complete a flight due to the fact that they are still waiting on Blue Origin to deliver a functional BE-4 engine, which does not appear to be happening anytime soon. Just FYI. Beyond Dream Chaser, Sierra Space was showing off a smaller model of its Life Habitat module. Like, much smaller though, like dollhouse sized. Both Dream Chaser and Life will be essential to the planned Orbital Reef Space Station, a collaboration between Sierra Space, Blue Origin, Boeing, and others. The commercial space station is set to be deployed between 2025 and 2030, with the completed station serving multiple purposes as a research laboratory, tourism destination, and manufacturing. Firefly Aerospace is pausing operations for its next Alpha rocket launch, which was originally scheduled for early 2022. This comes after the US government asked Firefly's largest shareholder to divest their ownership in the company for national security reasons. The government actually went so far as to limit Firefly operations at the Vandenberg Space Force base while the issue is being resolved. So what's the deal with that? Well, the principal shareholder of Firefly happens to be New Sphere Venture Partners, a fund run by Ukrainian-born investor Max Polyakov, and they announced on December 29th that the fund will comply and sell their interest in the rocket startup. That request to sell comes all the way from the Government Committee on Foreign Investment in the United States. It's still unclear what prompted this whole thing, although Firefly speculated in a statement that it was linked to growing tensions between Russia and Ukraine, including concerns in recent weeks Russia would attempt to invade parts of Ukraine. 
Polyakov acquired the assets of the former Firefly Space Systems in 2017 after it filed for bankruptcy. He invested $200 million to resurrect the company and allow it to continue development of its Alpha Small Launch Vehicle, which made its first orbital launch attempt in September. The rocket got off the ground fine, but exploded two minutes into the flight. Newsphere said in its statement that it owns an approximately 50% stake in Firefly. Before the government decision to halt Firefly launch preparations, the company had been gearing up for an alpha launch as soon as late January. In an interview in November, Jason Mello, president of Firefly Space Transportation Services, said the premature engine shutdown that doomed the first launch had a fairly easy and straightforward solution. He said the company would conduct up to four more alpha launches in 2022 if the upcoming launch was a success. So hopefully, this all gets sorted out quickly and they are back on schedule. In even more bad news for a struggling rocket startup, Astraspace could be facing a class action lawsuit for misleading investors. The Rosen Law Firm has opened an investigation into Astraspace Inc. due to allegations that the company presented misleading material to the public. And in this case, it does appear that the company may have had this coming. The firm Carisdale Capital published a report in December 2021 titled Headed for Disaster, which is a hilarious title, but there are some very serious accusations made in the text. Carisdale writes, Astra is poorly positioned within an overcrowded market for small launch vehicles. Its main competitors will soon be launching larger 1,000 kilogram plus payload rockets, while Astra has yet to overcome developmental hurdles necessary to successfully launch even a single satellite into any of the emerging broadband mega constellations. And they go on to say that Astra's investor pitch boils down to selling the pipe dream of an unprecedented number of cheap rocket launches. Astra's forecast calls for 300 launches per year by 2025, a whopping 10 times more than SpaceX achieved in 2021. The sick burns go on and on for around 25 pages of report. Now, it obviously should be noted that Carisdale is a short seller of Astra stock, so it's in their best interest for the company to fail. But that doesn't make any of their reporting untrue. For example, The Verge independently reported in September 2021 that Astra had made a secret deal with Firefly, where Astra would pay $30 million for the right to copy Firefly's Reaver rocket engine. This agreement came to light following Astra's infamous Power Slide launch, in which a Delphin rocket engine developed by Astra failed and caused the rocket to take off sideways. The Rosen Law Firm, a global investor rights law firm, has opened an investigation into Astra Space based on the allegations outlined in the Carisdale Capital report. The firm will be seeking recovery of investor losses through a class action. The Federal Aviation Administration announced on December 28, 2021, that the final programmatic environmental assessment for the SpaceX Starbase Orbital Launch Facility has been delayed until February 28th, 2022. We had originally been told in November that the review process would be complete by the end of the year, but that's clearly not the case. In a statement, the agency says, quote, under the oversight of the FAA, SpaceX is currently drafting responses for the over 18,000 public comments received on the draft PEA and continues to prepare the final PEA for the FAA's review and acceptance. In addition, the FAA is continuing consultation and coordination with other agencies at the local, state, and federal level. The environmental review is just one part of the FAA commercial space licensing process. SpaceX license application must also meet FAA safety, risk, and financial responsibility requirements. So that's not great news. It kind of seems like they are shoving off the responsibility onto the large number of comments that they received. And fair, 18,000 is a lot, and we can imagine most of those are going to either be from SpaceX fanboys or Elon Musk haters, which would probably be exhausting to read through all day. This puts the kibosh on Elon's hopeful timeline of getting the first launch in January or February. 
it's not going to happen, which is a bummer. But at the same time, it is an unprecedented launch of the biggest and most powerful rocket in history, so it's probably not bad that these things have a lengthy approval process. Meet us back here every week for more updates on everything aerospace industry and interstellar exploration related. Make sure to give the video a thumbs up today if you liked it. That really helps us out, seriously. And subscribe to The Space Race for more videos just like this. We do one long form essay and one news update every single week.